anything else you need? Yep, I think so. Sure, I'll uh, give you a little introduction. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Day two of moving into our 2016. Everybody having a good time? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to the DNA workshop. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the second day of DNA lectures, uh, which have been kindly sponsored by Family Tree DNA, which has a stand just on the other side. So if you're inspired to take DNA tests by Debbie's book, then just pop over to the stand and have your, your cheeks swapped. We also have uh, the ISOG stand here. These lectures were organized by ISOG, with myself and Debbie are volunteers with the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. In fact, Debbie has done the bulk of the work organizing these DNA lectures, so the reason you're here is largely because of Debbie. <laughs> um, now, Debbie is an honorary research associate in the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment at the University College London. She's a member of ISOG and co-founder of the ISOG Wiki, uh, which we'll hear a little bit about. She is the administrator of the Cruz uh, DNA project, the Devon DNA project, and the mitochondrial DNA capital group U4 project. She has written two books for the History Press. One is called DNA and Social Networking, and the other one is the Surname's Handbook. Um, are they available for sale here today? On the ISOC stand. On the ISOC stand. So if you're interested, you can pick one of those books up on the ISOC stand. Uh, she has a very popular uh, blog called Cruise News, which was originally set up to publish findings from her well known study, but is now focused on keeping up with all the latest developments in the world of genetic genealogy. So it's no uh, better person to speak to us about DNA demystifying a beginner's guide to genetic genealogy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Morris, for that uh, introduction. Um, okay, uh, these, this talk is being recorded, um, so you will be able to go back and look at all the slides on the YouTube channel, so don't worry about taking notes. Um, if anyone wants it, I can actually supply a PDF of all the slides if you want to uh, and refer to anything again. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and do my best to explain to you about genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy is a combination of using genealogy with genetic records. Um, so it's a very new discipline, it's really only started in the year 2000. It's now getting quite sophisticated and the databases are building up to a reasonable size that people are getting all sorts of answers out of the database. I'm going to be talking about the three different tests that we're going to be using today. Um, we've got the first test is the Y chromosome DNA test and this is a test that can only be taken by males and it follows the direct male line, which is normally the same path as surnames. And we're also going to be looking at the mitochondrial DNA test, and this test follows up to direct female line, so that's the two outer branches of your family tree. Now, both of these tests can be used for recent genealogy, uh, but they also take you back into your deep ancestry, going back for thousands and thousands of years. And the final test, and this is the newest of the three tests, is an autosomal DNA test. And this test will give you matches of genetic cousins on all of your different family lines, but it has a much more limited reach. Um, it really is best used within about the last five or six generations. So it's a question of choosing the test that you want for the, um, for the, the hypothesis that you want to, to test. And you can actually use the different tests together in combination as well. So the important thing about DNA is another type of genealogical record that we use in our research. There's nothing special about it. You can't just take a DNA test and have all your family history um, provided for you. Um, so we have to use the, the DNA evidence in combination with all the documentary records to draw our conclusions. And the way DNA testing works, it, it relies on having large databases, and it's the, having those databases is it, it's the matches with other people that gives you the, the answers. And unlike paper records, with DNA, you have to get that record while you have the chance, while the people are still alive. Um, you, it, it can sometimes be long-term investment. People can take a test, and they don't actually get an answer straight away. You may, may have to wait five years, ten years, um, but that record will always be available if you test with a company where your DNA can be preserved. Um, and a family tree DNA, you can actually nominate the beneficiary 
for your DNA kit. So if you've got, say, an elderly relative, you can get them tested and someone else, you can then take over the, the, the care of that kit for them. So that result keeps on working for people. But the tests have been available since the year 2000. Many of the people in the databases have now actually passed away, but we've got relatives managing their kits and those kits are being upgraded even after their um, deaths. Sorry to be so morbid, but this is a problem that we're already having to face. Okay, so how can we use DNA testing? First of all, we can just use it to verify our existing family trees. If you've got a particular hypothesis you want to test, do, you've got perhaps two people with the same surname, you want to know if they share the same family tree. You may, want to, you may have an errant great-grandfather who had lots of different wives and you want to find out if all the children were, were actually his children or if they were from another father. So it's a question of choosing the test to get the answer you want. It can sometimes help with brick walls if you've got an illegitimacy or if someone's adopted or even with foundlings and there you are relying on the databases alone and finding the matches with the right people. And sometimes it can just give you a geographical focus for your research. If you match someone who's got more information on their family tree than you have, then that can sometimes save you a lot of time and effort. With the Y-DNA test, we can look at surnames and explore their, their evolution and their origin. We normally do that within structured surname projects. And it can just be fun just to take a DNA test and just to see who else you match in the, in the database. And um, just one um, word of caution, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question. Sometimes people don't get the answers that they want, and sometimes people take a test and get unexpected results. Um, so not everyone um, will discover they have Darth Vader as their father, but um, people, uh, we have had uh, a number of unexpected results. Sometimes it's a pleasant surprise, and sometimes it's not. I've got someone in one of my projects who discovered that his father was not his father. Um, so just be aware that those sort of things can happen. Okay, so the first test I'm going to look at in more detail is the autosomal DNA test. And I think if anyone is thinking of testing, this is now probably the first test you need to take. It's the cheapest of the three tests. And um, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, anyone can take it. Um, and it's the one that represents all the different family lines. Now with this test, we've got to, actually got a choice of three different companies. 23andMe were the first company who launched this test, but um, they uh, offer a health test. So it's mainly for, their test is mainly for health reasons, and when you go into their matching database, um, you end up with lots of people who've tested for health reasons, and then they're not really interested in pursuing genealogy. So I'm not really going to be talking about them in, in great detail today. Family Tree DNA were the next people who came up with a cousin matching test. And then Ancestry DNA launched their test back in, in the UK only in January 2015. So you've got three companies to choose from. Um, Ancestry have the largest database, and 23andMe the next largest. Both of those are there about 90% in the US. Family Tree DNA have been, had a presence in the UK for longer than the, they're, they're the only ones who've actively been coming over here and marketing their product in the UK. So they and they've also they also have the benefit of selling worldwide. Um, so if you've got relatives in South Africa, Thailand, um, Argentina, Brazil, wherever they are in the world, you, that anyone can test. Um, whereas the other um, companies, they've got a limited number of uh, countries where they actually um, sell their tests. Um, with Ancestry, you have, um, when you pay for the test, um, you can only access the full results of the test if you maintain an Ancestry subscription. So that's something to be aware of. So although they're selling the test at £59 here, um, if you haven't got that subscription, you won't be able to access all the features of the test. And that's something you'd have to maintain if you want to see all the family trees of your matches. Um, whereas if you test a family tree DNA, it's a one-off fee, and then you have, have continuous access to the, the database. But it, depending on, on your problem, if, you're, if you've got if people who are adopted, people who've got illegitimacies, you really need to be in both databases. Um, and the other difference is with the, um, the tools that they provide, um, a lot of us like using what's called a chromosome browser, which I'll be showing you later, and also we like to have the raw data for the matching segments, which you only get from family tree DNA at the moment and not from uh, ancestry. Um, so you can go back and look at that on the recording anyway. I won't uh, go into all the details there. 
Um, now, if you test an ancestry DNA, you can do a transfer to family tree DNA. The transfer is free, um, but you'd have to pay a small fee, which is about £25, to access the rest of your matches. So, if you want to be in two databases, that's the, the most um, cost efficient way to do that. So, the autosomal DNA test, as I said, it, it's a test that can be taken either by males or by females. And the autosomal DNA represents all of our different ancestors of all those different family lines. But it's best used for matching with cousins in about the last five or six generations. So it's got a reach of about 200, sometimes a bit more than that, 300 years. And it works on the principle of matching segments of DNA. So if you have a share large lots of segments and lots of large segments with someone, then it means you're closely related. And if it's a smaller segment, it's a more distant relationship and they can give you predictions of the relationships. And of course the difficulty is you don't know which line the match could be on, it could be on any of the lines. And with this test, because of limited reach, it's best to test the oldest generations first. So if you've got parents alive, if you've got aunts or uncles, make sure you test them while you have the chance. And it also helps with this test to test lots of um, other close relatives, so that um, say if you test a first cousin, if you match and a first cousin match with someone, then you know it's off, the match is on that specific line. So the more people you test, the, the, the better results you get out of this. Um, just a few basics, I don't want to go too much into the biology, but it, um, we all have um, 46 chromosomes. We inherit 23 chromosomes from our mother, 23 from our father, and then one of those pairs of chromosomes, those are the sex chromosomes. So if you're a female, you will have two X's. If you're a male, you will have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. The important, now the Y chromosome is one that is a special one because that is just passed on from father to son. But the important feature about the autosomes is that they recombine. So they get shuffled up. So the DNA that you get from your parent is actually a combination of the uh, it's like a sort of patchwork of the DNA that you've inherited from all four of your um, grandparents. Um, and so that sort of shuffling up process, that's what makes it so difficult to assign the line as you go further back in time. Um, now the, the amount of DNA that you get is also diluted. So you will get 50% of your DNA from your mother, 50% from your father. Then as you go further back in time, it's halved every generation. So you will have about 25% of your 25% uh, of your DNA will come from each of your four grandparents, but the proportions are not always the same. So you may get only 19% from one grandparent, and you might get 29% from another grandparent. Um, and then as we go back through the generations, then again the amount of DNA starts to reduce. So that by the time you get out to the sixth cousin level, um, you're only likely to share just one small little segment of DNA if you share any DNA with them at all. Um, now with the different tests, um, if, you, if you've got a particular hypothesis to test, then um, that is best done with the very close relations. These tests are very, very accurate up to the second cousin level. So if you've got someone who's a first cousin and you and your first cousin don't match, you need to go back and ask some questions. And the same with second cousins. Um, but, and so we've not yet seen any case of second cousins who tested who have not matched each other. Um, but when you get out to third cousins, there are people who are legitimate third cousins um, who just purely because of that random process of inheritance will not actually share enough DNA in common to show up as a match. Now, ancestry at the moment do a complicated technique called phasing, which in, uh, actually improves the accuracy of the matches. So they claim that they can find more um, third cousins. They reckon up to 98%, and they reckon they can get more second, more fourth cousins up to 71%. Um, but you can see once you get out to the sort of fifth, sixth cousin level, then that's when it becomes much, much more difficult. Um, this is what my match page looks like, Ancestry DNA, and the companies actually do the predictions for you. They all your results go into the database, and they look at, they compare your results with everyone else in the database, and they give you a list of all your cousins, and they give you a prediction of the relationship. So I've got 68 pages of matches here. I've got, um, and that's 50 matches to a page. It's over 3,000 matches. 
but most of them are distant cousins. I've got, um, I've actually confirmed two matches here, one with a third cousin, one with a third cousin once removed, and I've got, um, I know up to 27 fourth cousins, but all those other ones are very, very distant cousins. So this is something you'll find um, with all the companies, you will end up with thousands, you've got lots and lots of matches, but you won't actually be able to find the relationship with the vast majority of those matches. But when you do actually have a match, then it's really exciting to actually have that uh, connection and uh, it, it's, it's like if you remember genes reunited this really is genes reunited where you're actually matching people through the uh, genetics and this is what my family finder matches look like um, and you can see there um, I've actually tested my father and my mother luckily they both match me at uh, family tree DNA and I've also tested my son um, and if you, with the family tree DNA one, if you have a surname in common, that will show up in bold in the match list. So that's one way of filtering through the matches. I have about um, 500 matches at family tree DNA because they have a smaller database. Um, but uh, they also have all these extra features. You can probably just about see there the chromosome browser and they give you all the segment lengths and everything. <laughs> um, so this is a chromosome browser. Um, yes, just really to illustrate how the DNA is passed on. This is actually my mother and my son and a comparison between them and the orange bits are the segments that they share in common. And you can probably see on there, um, so this chromosome here, my son has inherited the entire chromosome from his grandmother and then he's got another one down here where he doesn't have any DNA on that chromosome at all from his grandmother. And then when you go out to third cousins, um, this, you've just got fewer segments that you share in common. And here we've just got the four segments. And by the time you get out to um, fifth or sixth cousins, if you're going to share any DNA at all, it's probably going to be just one segment there. Um, now, another point to bear in mind is that we have a we have two types of family trees. We have the genealogical tree that we can research. and that's my attempt to trace my genealogical tree. I've got one line I can trace way back to the 1200s, but I've also got these big gaps in my tree here where I, I've got an illegitimacy back in the 1800s and I just can't get through there. Um, but the other thing is we also have a genetic tree and our genetic tree is smaller than our genealogical tree because our genetic ancestors actually start falling off our tree. So once you get back to about five or six generations back in time, you've got some ancestors from whom you have no DNA at all. So those are the ones I've sort of indicated in white. It's a, a, a random process, so that's not necessarily accurate. But that is the sort of level where the ancestors start dropping off your tree. So that's why it's important to test the oldest generation. So by testing my, both my parents, that takes me back one further generation and that covers those bits where those ancestors are dropping off. And if you haven't got parents, if you test siblings, because each sibling gets a different representation of DNA. So it may be that my sister has a bit of DNA from those ancestors that I don't have in my DNA. So again, it's, the, the important message is to test as many people as possible with this test to get the best results out of it. And I'm just going to run through how it works, so that you, uh, just to share a couple of stories so that you can see how the test works in practice. And um, this is one of my matches at Family Tree DNA, and I mentioned you get the surnames showing up in bold. So this is actually my dad's account, and on here you can just about make out the name Cruz, which is um, uh, shown there in bold, and that's actually my maiden name. Um, and so I, when this match arrived, I was actually really excited because um, this person, all his ancestry is in Prince Edward Island in Canada and all our ancestry is in England, but we had got suspicions that we'd got someone who'd emigrated to Canada. And when I was doing the family tree, I'd, um, it was actually the brother of my great-great-great-grandfather um, who was born in Devon, and one of his brothers um, suddenly disappeared after the 1841 census, and so there was no sign of any birth or marriage or death. And um, there was a family that we found in Prince Edward Island in Canada, but we couldn't I couldn't link them in with the UK records and I got a marriage certificate from Prince Edward Island um, you may not be able to read that very well but the missing feature of that um, Canadian marriage record is that there is no father's name on the certificate 
So I haven't got a single piece of paper that will actually prove that this, um, the person in Canada is the same as the one in Devon. But now we've got this DNA match and the predicted relationship that we've worked out from our genealogical trees is exactly the same as we get from the DNA match. So this is the match. That's how it works with my dad. You can see he's got three segments of DNA that he shares. And then compared with me, just to show you how the DNA is diluted, I've only got one of those three segments. So you can see how fragile the DNA is and you know, how important it is to get those generations. I actually, when I tested my son, he actually still had that same segment of DNA, but it could be lost in my other son. I haven't tested him yet. He may have lost that altogether. Now, DNA testing can be very, very powerful, and this is going to happen more and more as the databases grow in size for people who don't have any genealogical records at all. Um, this is the case of Michelle Rooney. She was a, a, a foundling. She was known as the dustbin baby because she was actually found in a dustbin um, in a carrier bag, and someone had heard the sound of the baby crying and went out and rescued her from the dustbin. So she grew up her whole life not knowing who she was. And when DNA testing came along, she took a family finder test, really more to find out about her, you know, sort of admixture and ethnicity, not really expecting much from it. And she had a match in the database with a first cousin. And so she contacted this first cousin, they exchanged information. And the first cousin was then able to sort of look at her tree, and she thought that her uncle might have, um, she had someone in the tree who she thought might be the father, it was her uncle. So they had this man tested and it came back as a father-daughter match. So Michelle was actually able to go and meet her father and sadly she only had a short time with him because he died um, within about six months after she met him. But she, that is something you would just never find any other way. And we're seeing this happen. In America they're getting success stories like this virtually every day. A lot of people don't go public, but there is a DNA detectives group where people are sharing their stories, and it seems like every day there is a new person who's found their biological mother. We've got founding cases in the UK where we've, they're now almost breaking through, and we're finding the answers. And oh, the, the other part of the story was that uh, Michelle was actually reunited with her mother as well. The mother, this was not through DNA testing. The mother came forward as a result of all the, the press attention. Um, and they did actually take a DNA test, but you, you can see from the picture that they, they're so alike, but it came back mother-daughter. So these sort of tests are actually much, much more accurate. I mean, you can pay to have a paternity test or a relationship test at various companies. They test a tiny number of markers, but this is a conclusive test, and you get a conclusive answer. Um, the other part of the autosomal DNA test, you get these um, admixture results. Um, this is really um, this is really more for entertainment value, I would say, for most people, because the, the tests are, they can distinguish at the continental level, so if you've got African DNA or Asian DNA, that will be picked up, but they can't distinguish between French DNA and German DNA and Irish DNA, so um, I come out here with, um, I think it's 50, um, 56 percent or whatever it is of um, so-called British DNA, Lots of Americans come out with 95% um, British DNA, um, whereas you know, all the native Brits end up with quite small proportions of, uh, um, of British. Um, so that's what I get with um, family tree DNA. These are my results at 23andMe. They're pretty much on a par with the, the ones at um, family tree DNA. Again, I'm about 56, 57% British and Irish. And then these little trace populations. None of these, ex these little trace populations mean anything. So if you come out with a test and it tells you you're a certain percentage French or German, just ignore it. It doesn't actually mean that you've got French or German ancestors within a meaningful time frame. And then ancestry, I get different results altogether. I'm, I've got a very high percentage of Irish, even though I've got hardly any Irish ancestry, and uh, I'm only 25% British, I think I am on there, 21% British. Um, but one thing with these tests, all the companies are, they're, they're trying to refine their databases. Both Ancestry and Family Tree DNA have new versions of their tests coming out soon, and 23andMe are also um, be making improvements to their database as well. And when you've got your results, 
um, I just wanted to mention um, this one particular site um, called GEDmatch. If you've tested at one company and you haven't tested at the other companies, you can upload your results here and you can all compare your results. Um, and there are various other tools that you can use if the more advanced researchers. I've put a, a link, link at the bottom there um, of autosomal DNA tools. But on GEDmatch also you've got all sorts of different um, admixture analyses that you can use and you can play around with and compare yourselves with all sorts of populations and ancient DNA populations. Whether or not it means anything, I don't know, but it, it can be sometimes be fun to do. Okay, so the, um, the second test I'm going to be um, talking about is the Y chromosome test. And this is the one that follows the surname line. Um, now, the limitation with the Y chromosome is that only males have a Y chromosome. Because if you remember, as I said earlier, females have two X's and males have an X and a Y. So for this test, it's a question of finding the right male relative with the surname. So if, obviously, if you're a male, you can take the test yourself. But if it's a particular problem on a particular line, it's a question of finding that relative with that surname to test. Sometimes you have to go up the tree and down another branch of the tree to find the right person. And with the Y-DNA test, we do the, um, the we always test within a surname project. Um, and at Family Tree DNA, they have a it's now getting over 9,000 different surname projects. So all common surnames will be in a surname project. If you've got a very rare surname, it may be there's no project set up at the moment. But do have a look at the project list and see what surnames exist. And um, when you test through a project, you also get a discount um, when you when you actually order the test through them. And I should say, all the projects are run by volunteers, people like me, who just have an interest in a surname, and we're just doing it because we want to find out about our surname. So the test, the Y chromosome test works, the Y chromosome, unlike the autosomal DNA, which gets shuffled up all the time, the Y chromosome is passed on intact from father to son. It's just every now and then you get tiny changes, um, little mutations that occur. And it's just these small little changes that we can um, look at and that helps us to differentiate between different uh, lineages. So for this test we look at, at a particular type of marker called a, a short tandem repeat called an STR and these are places where the Y chromosome is particularly prone to mutations. And then for each marker you get a number and it's, it's right, like being in a sort of number matching game so all the numbers just go into a database and the numbers are compared and then the more markers you match, the closer you're related to someone. So this is what you get for your DNA result, this very unhelpful list of numbers, um, but that's your lottery ticket in effect, so your numbers go into the database and on their own those numbers don't tell you anything at all, it's the people that you match that give you the, um, the information. So uh, the whole value of the test is actually this comparison process. Um, I'll show you in a minute how the, the markers work. So you have to have, you have to match on enough markers for there to be a meaningful match. And then if you have lots and lots of mismatching markers, then there's no relationship in a genealogical time frame. So this is just an example of my own surname project. The, the top four people are all closely related to each other. You can see the top two people they match on every single marker, and the second two people they match on every, they match each other on that number 27. But all the other markers are the same. So the top four people are all in one, what we call, genetic family. And sometimes you get these small mutations like that where it actually divides the branches of the family. In this case, the ones with the number 27, I think they're a Canadian branch, and then the ones with the 28, they're the ones who stayed behind in Devon. So that can be useful information on its own. And then the bottom line is someone with the same surname, the same part of Devon, and you can see virtually every single marker is different. So in that case, we know that they're not related on that direct male line. And we've got, a, there's a range of tests. When, back in the year 2000, you could only get a 12 marker test and it was much more expensive, but now we start with a 37 marker test and um, that, th those are the project prices. You pay much more if you, go, if you don't go through a project. And these tests are on the special offer at the, at the show here today as well. But normally if you're starting with um, my DNA testing, I would recommend starting with a 37 marker test. Um, I would recommend a 67 marker test if you're trying, if you've got an illegitimate line, because the interpretation of results is more complicated when it's two different surnames. Um, so you need that extra confidence of the extra markers. 
And this is what you get when you get your Y DNA matches. And obviously, I don't have the Y chromosome, so this is my dad's uh, matching page here. And you get some, um, of course, the important part of this is where it says matches. And these are my dad's matches. And his surname is Cruz, and there he is matching with lots of other people with the surname Cruz. Um, and also a few other surnames have, um, have cropped into the list as well. So that is quite common, and we've got something there on the left, genetic distance. Um, that means the number of mismatching markers. So when it's a genetic distance of one, that's one mismatching marker. When it's a genetic distance of four, that's four mismatching markers. So as you get more mismatching markers, you do start to pull in other surnames. But if you get an exact match and it's a different surname, then sometimes that can mean something funny has been going on. <laughs> and that, these are the results of my Cruise DNA project. All the, all the surname projects, most of them have public websites, and we put all the results up on the website. And we group everyone together in genetic families. So each colour band, that represents a new genetic family. And on that first line, that's actually my own particular grouping. And I've got people in there, you can tell different spellings of the surname and different lines from Ireland, America, England, um, Devon, Canada, all, so all over the place. But they, they're all related to each other because they, they all match very closely on their genetic markers. And uh, in some cases, I've got another one here where the person didn't match and he's on his own, but in fact that was actually a useful result because it confirmed that we, what we thought, that that was an illegitimate line. Um, and we're hoping to get clues from the DNA test about where that line came from. Um, just again to show you the power of um, the, the, the um, DNA testing, um, this is a story from my project. And, uh, I had a gentleman come to me when I first started out my DNA project, and he was researching his, um, it was his great-grandfather, um, Harry Cruz, or Henry Cruz, and the story went that he was shipwrecked off the coast of South Africa. And he was the sole survivor of this shipwreck, and he swam to shore, and then we've got this uh, bay in South Africa that's named Harry's Bay after him. But when he came to do the research, um, the, he got a death notice from South Africa, which very helpfully told us that Henry Cruz was born in Great Britain, but didn't say where in Great Britain, so it left us with three countries to choose from. We had the, um, we've got the age of death, and so we had a sort of rough idea of the, the date of birth. So then he was trying to look for people, for Henry Cruz, who's born anywhere in Great Britain, round about 1826, but um, getting nowhere. So he actually spent a fortune hiring professional genealogists to do all this research, and researching all sorts of different Family. So my one name study benefited enormously from all this research, but he, he still didn't provide any answers. And he was one of the first people to join my project. And he sat in the database, first of all, with no results, and then eventually he started to get um, some matches coming in. And all the people that he matched, we've got a very well, a very detailed family tree that is actually from Wiltshire. All these people, we can actually connect them in, in one big family tree. So we actually now know which tree which part of the tree he's from, um, purely from the DNA match. So that shows you how it can sometimes kickstart your research and actually give you that um, sort of information that you just wouldn't get in any other way. Um, the other part of the test, when you get your results, um, you can probably just see on there the word haplogroup, and you've got all these letters and numbers down here. So these are what we call the haplogroups. And those are, um, they're, they're sort of distant, the, the, the deep branches of the human family tree. And all these different haplogroups, they have their own um, different geographical distribution patterns. So if you were, I say, a haplogroup A, I would be able to tell you you're probably from Africa. If you were a haplogroup Q, you're probably a Native American. If you were a haplogroup H, you're probably Indian. Um, but some, the haplogroup itself can sometimes be quite um, interesting. So if, if you're a British person and you ended up with haplogroup H, um, the most likely explanation is you've got like Romney Gypsy ancestry because they originally came from Africa and a lot of the, the Romneys are haplogroup H. Um, we've had some um, English people who are haplogroup A in Yorkshire, um, which is a bit, big surprise, and they were able to trace their tree back many generations in Yorkshire, couldn't work out the connection with Africa, so 
no one really knows what happened there, but most British people will come out hat the group R1B. Um, about 70% of people will come out hat the group R1B. Um, and this is an area where people, you can actually go on and order extra tests. People get re really excited, some people, about their deep ancestry, and you can actually refine your hat for group and do all sorts of factor tests, like the big Y test, that will give you all your markers going right down for many, many generations. But that's the subject of another talk. We've got other talks on the, in that area later on. Um, if you do find you are Hatch Group R1B, you can join the, there's an R1B and subclades project. There are projects for all the different Hatch Groups that you can uh, join. And this is now the largest project at Family Tree DNA. They just hit the 10,000 mark to, um, just yesterday. So the first ever project to have 10,000 project members. And they, they, again, this is all volunteers doing the work. And they will actually advise, if you want to go down the route of ordering big Y testing and all the fancy tests, they will actually um, give you the help on doing that. And as well as the Hapter Group projects, there are also geographical projects. And I run a project for the English County of Devon. There are other projects for Cornwall, Hampshire, and there's a big um, the British Isles by County project. We've got um, projects for Wales, Ireland, Scotland. There are also projects for all sorts of European countries. There's Middle Eastern projects. So you name it, the projects are out there. And also lots of specialist projects. We've got a, there's a Jewish project. There's even one for adoptees, and there's a project for um, donor-conceived um, adults as well who are using DNA testing trying to find uh, their, the names of their fathers. Um, okay, so the final test, I'm not going to spend so much time with this one. Um, this, uh, this is probably more of, if for genealogy purposes, this is the least useful of the three tests, but it can still sometimes be an interesting test to do. Um, this test follows the direct maternal line. And mitochondrial DNA is passed on by a mother to her children. So she passes it on to both her male and her female children, but the males are a dead end. They can't pass it on to the next generation. So this traces that all female line. So it doesn't, it, both of you, males and females, can test. So it's mother's, 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 mother's line. Um, now one of the problems, of course, is that when, a, when it's passed on through that female line, surnames are passed on to the male line. So every generation you've got the surname changing. So you don't have that surname clue when you're looking at the matches, and you don't have that surname clue if you're trying to recruit other people to test. And also it has quite a low mutation rate. Um, so that means that it doesn't, it's not very good at discriminating, so you can match people and they, they can actually be related quite some distance, some time in the past. But in, until recently, when you saw all the stories in the paper about ancient DNA, it was all mitochondrial DNA that was being used. That's changing now with new advances, but certainly in the early days, mitochondrial DNA is the first thing that they tested because um, there's in each cell there are lots and lots of mitochondria, so um, if you're going to get any DNA it's going to be mitochondrial DNA in the first instance. Um, so just to remind you of the path of inheritance, it's just that one very specific line. And people always get confused, it's not every single person on the, your mother's line, it's just this one all-female line. So it's, the easiest thing is to draw out a family tree with these tests and make sure you're testing the right person for the, the test you want. Um, now there are two tests for mitochondrial DNA. You can either just have a basic test, um, which is the, the cheap test, or, um, or you can have your whole mitochondrial genome sequence. When these tests first became available, the only test you could get was the very basic test, and that, all that does, it tests this tiny little bit of your mitochondrial genome at the top here called the control region, and that's where most of the mutations take place. But now you can have the whole thing done. About five years ago it would have cost you probably a thousand dollars or so to have the whole thing done, and now it's about, it's just over a hundred pounds. I think it's on special offer at the show, it's only about a hundred pounds at the show here. Um, so now you, this is one part of your gene where you can have the entire mitochondrial DNA sequenced and once that's done, that's it. There's nothing more that you can do with your mitochondrial DNA. Um, so that is, that is really sort of the far furthest we can go. Um, and again, this works on a matching database. So these are, these are my matches. Um, and with mitochondrial DNA, we're generally looking for an exact match. This is the genetic distance again. And here we really wanted someone who's zero. I've got genetic distance of one and three and this actually pulls in people with quite um, disparate origins so one of my uh, my line is from Wiltshire 
and here I am matching some graduate students from Spain and someone from Romania. Um, so um, it, it, it's got a very deep time frame. Um, these, these are the guidelines that they give us. So if you have a, an exact full sequence match, they say that 95% of the time the match will fall somewhere within about the last 550 years. Uh, and that's still these 5% that fall outside that time. But they did, they, they've even tried to estimate what the time is if you have one or two or three mismatches. And with the mitochondrial DNA, you also get the haplogroups. Um, and the haplogroups themselves can actually be um, quite informative. Um, um, especially um, a lot of people in the families in British India society are using mitochondrial DNA testing in particular because um, a lot of uh, British men went out to British India, as it then was, and they married local women. And sometimes the only trace of that that you get will be in a DNA test. So if you take a DNA test and you are half the group M, which is normally found in India, then that is probably what happens. Um, the half the group A, B, C and D, they're the ones that are normally found in Native Americans. And there's a number of European ones, so it's half group H is about 40% of Europeans and then you've got T, U, H and J, and they're found in, in lower frequencies. And with the haplogroups groups, again, you can join projects. I run the haplogroup group U4 project, I'm up to 800 and odd members. Um, and we, so that's the night, that's an easy way of grouping the results. Um, so. Um, so you'd actually get a bit more out of your results and, and see which other, and get an idea of the geographical distribution of your particular haplogroup. group. And sometimes it's interesting just to compare your results with um, famously Richard III is probably the, the best known case of a, a practical application of DNA testing. Um, but the important point there, it wasn't just the mitochondrial DNA that was used to confirm his identity, it was all the other information used in combination, which is exactly what we do with genealogy. So it's not just the DNA, it's everything else used together to form the conclusion. Um, now with Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, Family Tree DNA are now the only company that we can use for these tests because they are the only company who have the matching databases. So they dominate the market and they've got um, about half a million Y-DNA results. They're getting on for 9,000 surname projects, about 200,000 mitochondrial DNA tests. And they also have all these advanced um, Y chromosome tests if you want to go down that route. Um, all the sort of fanciful SNP testing. They have a partnership with um, something called the Genographic Project, which is deep ancestry. But people who've tested with the Genographic Project can transfer their results to the Ancestry DNA database. And that's actually brought in quite a nice international mix of people. So in my U4 project, I've got people from Russia and Finland and um, Germany and Austria and from all over the world, so all sorts of different countries. So we've got a really nice international genetic genealogy community now. Um, now, um, if you are a male here, um, do go and pay a visit to the ISOG stand over there. Um, we've got a number of surname projects that are offering free DNA tests if you have a surname that's of interest. Um, so go and see if your surname is on the list. And there's also a list on the ISOG wiki where we have um, all the offers of free DNA, tis, uh, free, free DNA tests listed. So do check on that list from time to time. But if you're on the list there, now you can have a test done on the spot and, uh, and that will all be paid for you by the project administrators. And I just wanted to mention quickly about resources. Um, ISOG is um, the, the, the primary resource for genetic genealogy. If you, you, we've got some handouts on the ISOG stand over there. Um, we've got a wiki, we've got a, a very active Facebook group, there's all sorts of different mailing lists and there's, there are a lot of people out there who are willing to offer advice and support. Um, and I've got a blog where I publish various articles as well. And I just wanted to put in a word for the, this particular, if you're on Facebook group, this is a very helpful UK um, DNA Facebook group and we're, we're now up to over a thousand members on there and we've got a lot of people in the UK now who are getting very knowledgeable about DNA testing and who are able to, to help. One time it was just a, a few of us and so it's really nice to see how it's grown in the last few years. Okay, so just to sum up, um, the why we've looked at the three different tests. The Y-DNA test is the one that follows that father's 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 line. 
Mitochondrial DNA is the mother's, mother's, mother's line. Autosomal DNA is the one that looks, gives you matches of all your genetic cousins and all your different family lines. It's very important to test people while you still have the chance. Um, it, it's best used for test for if you've got a particular hypothesis to test. That's the most effective way of using DNA testing. But it can be fun to, to go on what we call a fishing ship and just to see what is going to happen because you never quite know what you're going to catch. Okay? Thank you, Debbie. Just out of interest, how many people in the audience have actually done a DNA test? I should have asked that, shouldn't I? Right. Oh, right, okay, so quite a few. And how many people are thinking of doing a DNA test? Right. Yeah, quite a few. Okay, good to know. Um, any questions for Debbie? Yeah, we have a question down here. If you're on a test, no, can you do an update to get more people come off the Yes, you can, yes. So yes, DNA is stored for 25 years at uh, Family Tree DNA. Oh, the questions back here. Oh, lovely. Um, well, someone said, why do you do this? And the MC DNA is done by you about five years ago. I must have about over 200 hits on my tree. Not one of them has had any connection whatsoever. Is that on the body? Yeah, they all seem to be American, but that would be the labor treaty. Yeah, it varies considerably from one person to another. Some people can take a test and not have any matches at all with the, with the Y DNA. Um, and with the autosomal DNA, people do have lots and lots of matches where they just can't make any connections at all. So it's, it's the luck of a draw, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Okay, well, you obviously explained everything very well. Right. So, um, uh, yes, please uh, show your appreciation for Debbie Payne. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to mention my books, never mind. We could yeah. mention that at the beginning. <laughs> um, I'll leave it up there anyway. We can leave it up there for. Yeah. Couple of minutes. Yeah, I can do. I might ask you a question. Sure. I didn't want to put in front of the whole crowd. Yeah, sure. Like close relatives. Yeah. Just take um, the mic off before you start having a chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take that bit. Yes, you start. Okay. My father's sister. Your next time. Right. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I believe she has a different mother right. to the rest of the family. Right. She was brought home. Slightly later, it looks like she has a different mother. Would an autosomal test um, and her supposed full brother, but probably half brother, my dad, would that would yes, that show sure conclusively? Because um, full siblings would share 50% of their DNA, half siblings would share 25% of their DNA. So that's the way to go. That's so do an autosomal on both of them and that would give you a that's definitive answer one way or the other, some other one not. So, yeah, yeah, as long as they want to know. Well, <laughs> they do. They want to know what they're like. Yeah. And they're very keen and they're quite elderly now. Yeah. So, as you say, yeah. time's running I, out. What I, um, yes, I think the tests are all on special offer here, so you could get the tests that they yeah. have show here now. Um, now, there is, with siblings versus full, um, full siblings, there is a different way of looking at results. It's also with all siblings, they share what are called fully identical regions, which you can't actually see. You would have to go to GenMatch to see that. You should be able to tell just from the percentage of DNA you share. I think you'll have the results for it. Yeah. 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 Yeah